But if we approach fever just as its own thing, then there are four sort of blocks that I kind of think about, and they are as follows. One, shock. Two, the young or physiologically robust patient. Three, the elderly and frail patient. And four, the patient with immune compromise. Um, so for most people, it's a body temperature of 100.4 degrees. Okay. Uh, core temperature. Um, some people say 101. Um, in the immunosuppressed, the, the, you call it a fever at 100.4 if they've had it for an entire hour or 104 Fahrenheit at one time. So the first question is, is there shock? And ask yourself, am I missing shock? So normal mentation, normal perfusion, no shock, then we move on. Two, the young and physiologically robust. You work up by symptoms, you know, and you assume infection. And then you, you try very hard not to miss immunosuppression, weird travel histories, or implanted har hardware. And if it's not really obvious, you know, um, what's causing the source of fever after you've kind of looked at all the symptoms and you've thought about hardware, your travel, and immunosuppression. At that point, you would consider a non-effective cause. So that would be like uh, an inflammatory vasculitis or myositis, a drug reaction, pancreatitis, lymphoma, right? Right. So if you've gone to that point and you're about to diagnose them with flu or gastro, that's like a full stop right there. Because whenever I, or I think anyone who's, who's been doing this well, is about to write, it's like, okay, this person's got flu. It's a full stop and you just think, am I effing up horribly? <laughs> Right, because that, that's the time. Right. You ask yourself, am I, am I missing? Then the things we miss when someone's writing flu in the chart is a CNS infection, like encephalitis or meningitis, yep. endocarditis, spinal ep epidural abscess. And okay. if you have a rash of diarrhea then, and you're saying, oh, this is gastro, then toxic shock. The important thing about toxic shock is it doesn't require a foreign body, as in like the nefarious tampon up the vagina. Okay? That is not always the way it presents. In fact, often toxic shock is just from a, a skin and soft tissue infection. Okay. And foreign body can also be the, 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 the source as well. And early encephalitis, like, like you know, the two the two ones we see often in this age group would be HSV and um, NMDA receptor antagonist encephalitis. Yeah. They have very odd presentations in addition to fever. So NMDA receptor antagonist uh, encephalitis usually presents um, with like we're finding difficulty and confusion and like really interesting uh, executive function loss. And uh, as classically described, HSV encephalitis presents with hypomania early. Like fever, hypomania, fever headache, and like sort of at mild agitation before, like they really get crazy. Because they're really crazy, you're going to work them up if they're in shock, right? right? At this point, I'd like to know briefly something we call faggot sign, F A G E T, and that is uh, the change in heart rate and respiratory rate with fever. So for every degree Fahrenheit or uh, 0.553 Celsius that your body temperature rises, your heart rate should go up by 10, your respiratory rate should go up by two to four breaths a minute. Now, in the old days, if you had relative bradycardia, your bradycardia, uh, your heart rate lower than one would expect for the degree of fever, that was called phagot sign, and that would suggest some sort of intercellular evil like typhoid from salmonella, leptospirosis, tularemia, brucellosis, right? Okay. In the old days. Now, that could still be the case, but for the most of the time, that's not the case. It's really pneumonia and beta blocker. Okay. You know, I mean, the old, the classics, typhoid, brucell, you know, leptospirosis, rheumatic fever, tularemia, Lyme, we still see those. But that's very, very rare. Usually the answer is because they've got a drug on board. Okay. Um, so let's break it down. So an early patient comes in with fever. One, most important thing, are they in shock? Okay, they're not in shock. Are we really sure they're not in shock? Are they in shock? Okay. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, no shock. Then we assume steps, we treat empirically, and we look for the source. And the source is usually one of three things. Right. Urine. Yep. That is the chest. Like pneumonia yeah. and or skin soft tissue infection. I've done that, and there's no there's, there's no obvious source. Then what you're gonna do next? Okay, am I missing immunosuppression? Is there indwelling catheter? Is there the peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis or ascending cholangitis? That's it's a big deal. Okay. Right. All right. And so they'll, they'll have that even without pain. Absolutely. Okay. So look, that's that's a weird thing. So fever without abdominal pain can be ascending cholangitis in an elderly and frail patient. Okay. No questions. Okay, check. Then the stuff that if, if it's not clearly urine, not clearly chest, you look at all the skin, and you're gonna ask yourself, infection, room, lymphoma. So the infection stuff would be endocarditis, perineal abscess, polyosomalitis, tuberculosis, right? Right. Rheumatologic stuff: giant cell arteritis, polymyalgia rheumatica. Okay. The, these are the culprits for elderly with fever, and they're much higher risk than than they are with um, with younger than younger younger patients. And then lastly, lymphoma. Great. And so if they look good enough to discharge. Remember, check their drug list. You will f them up. Great. Now let's say that you have an elderly frail patient who they come in and they've got like a very very minimal pneumonia or very very small skin soft tissue infection. You're like, you know what? They have a fever. They look pretty good. I'm gonna discharge them home with antibiotics. Okay. 
This is a great time to to fuck them over and murder them. I mean, I if you're looking forward to the opportunity, here's a way to just sneak it in. <laughs> <laughs> because most empiric antibiotic therapy trashes the metabolism of standing meds. And there's a few ones that really do just wonders with. Right, okay? right. Uh, warfarin. One, warfarin. Bingo. <laughs> Bingo. And you can't predict, so you have to look it up every time. Right. Two, digoxin. Also uh, fun. Nice. Okay. Also very fun to voice people with Three, oral hypoglycemic agents. Lots of metformin, but like glyburide, glipizide, stuff like that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You can put them down. Okay. So, um, statins. Yeah. You wouldn't think about that, but then they come in with like savage CK levels and terrible myopathies, and if, you know everything's all their muscles hemorrhaging. You're like, <laughs> and then lastly, non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers are the ones that end with pene, right? So like, imodapine, nicardapine, yeah. amlodipine, all those guys. They're pretty resilient. Uh, but verapamil diltiazem? Mm -hmm. No, and that's what she's. That's that's, that's real raw usually. A lot of people are on amlodipine, big deal. But if they're on diltiazem. Great. Um, just take the uh, take uh, trimethoprim uh, sulfa two DS caps twice daily for the next week. Don't don't see your doctor. <laughs> keep taking your warfarin and keep taking your diltiazem. And I guarantee you, you'll have a hypotensive bleeding patient within like a week or so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Last but not least, we're talking about immune compromised and fever. We already talked about how neutropenia we do oral. We do uh, we measure the temperature 38 38 over an hour or 38.3. One, at one time, and those are oral temperatures oh, rectal. because of the concern for uh, scratching the your your rectum and migrating bacteria uh, into the peritoneum thereby. So uh, the caveat to from medical school, I love that old joke that surgery should be like, there's only one reason, there's only two reasons, two, not to do metrics. One, the patient doesn't have an asshole, or two, <laughs> you don't have a finger. And I got so much trouble in medical school, so I was like, uh, and three, neutropenia? <laughs> You know, I was like, okay, so there are three reasons if you're a surgeon. Why not? No finger, no asshole, or neutropenia. If someone has neutropenia fever, how you're going to manage it, it's going to be very, very carefully done in concert with your hematologist. Um, usually this is iatrogenic because of cancer treatments. Rarely it's because of some spontaneous and perverse immune deficiency. What's less straightforward is um, the other types of immunosuppression that we don't consider as quickly. So people who have cirrhosis or portal hypertension, um, consider them as immune compromised. They're at higher risk for bacterial peritonitis, and we all know about spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, but also at higher risk for vibrio skin infections after salt, salt water exposure. Diabetes, I think we recognize that this re renders people with relative immune compromise, especially to skin and soft tissue infections and osteomyel osteomyelitis. DKA increases your risk substantially for a horrible disease called mucormycosis. Right, right. So after DKA, you have a high risk of mucormycosis, and that is treated surgically. So if someone's got a black spot on their face after DKA, assume it's mucor. Okay. Um, systemic lupus erythematosus, high risk of both ACS and skin soft tissue infections. And then, of course, any patient on a tumor necrosis alpha inhibitor, such as enterocept or infliximab, for all sorts, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, spondyloarthropathies, these patients are at high risk for infection. And they're also at higher risk for, um, you know, reactivation of, of viral infections. Okay. So, someone has a fever. And they, they're immune compromised because they have had bone marrow transplants. Don't just presume infection. So if you have someone who's got leukemia, leukemia lymphoma and they've had transplants, don't just assume infection. A very, very important cause of fever in this patient population is acute graft-versus-host disease. So acute graft-versus-host disease is often missed in the transplanted patient with leukemia lymphoma because we just presume that they're immune compromised and they have an infection. And in reality, they don't. They actually have graft-versus-host disease and it's a real problem. And then, of course, sweet syndrome and drug eruptions as well. All right, so that's a basic quick overview of fever.